Brian Lenskis from the Low Carb MD Podcast, and I'm here with another doc, Ron Rigby. How you doing? Family medicine, obesity medicine specialist here to join us at Low Carb Denver. And, and it's amazing just meeting everyone and hearing what you're doing in Utah. Tell everyone about how you got started and what you're doing. Well, kind of like, like about a, lot of the, a lot of other doctors, um, kind of lifestyle type things, having weight issues for myself, end up in the ER as a patient, not as a wow. doctor with some chest pain and decided it was now time to make some lifestyle changes and started to incorporate different lifestyle life things. So I started looking into it, um, being family practice trained, always interested in it, but wanted to do more with helping my patients and helping their metabolic health. So, so what was your progression? I mean, did you start doing it yourself and then you started yeah, I started in residency, dropped about 40 pounds, wow. was kind of stubborn, couldn't get past the 200 point, and got into practice, gained a little bit back. Um, but then when I needed some CME, I was looking around and there was a conference for bariatric physicians, uh, so obesity type medicine, and I went there and I met a couple of doctors who were doing this and I started to incorporate that a little bit more. I was actually training for a a marathon at the time thinking, oh, this is going to help me exercise more, lose weight. Wasn't. Um, but I changed my lifestyle kind of right then and there and kind of gone from there. What's your reception been from patients? Um, they're excited. They, a lot of times they'll go, it's nice to know somebody who actually deals with it themselves. Um, so they're more willing to come talk to me versus somebody who's quote unquote skinny, quote unquote healthy. And they go, they, the person doesn't understand, they're just trying to, another part of medicine where I actually do it, live it, um, struggle with it. It's kind of like what, what I heard from you is that idea is trying to incorporate it in our life to help us learn and grow. And what's the reception been for, you know, being obesity medicine specialist? You're consulting on those patients, you're not necessarily their primary. So what happens when they go back to their primary and tell stories about what you're doing? Um, get some mixed reviews. They kind of like, no, you shouldn't do that. It's going to hurt yourself. It's going to damage your kidneys, kind of the typical answers. Yeah. Um, but when they start seeing benefits, we check their lab work and it's improving. Now the specialists are starting to send people to me, the nephrologists, sends people to me. Um, the orthopedic surgeons will send people to me because they need to get their weight down so they can have the surgery. Um, we actually have a back specialist or a back surgeon group that just joined us and they're going, we're gonna start sending everybody to you so we can get their weight down so we can actually go do their surgery. Now a lot of times when they get their weight down, they have things improve enough they don't need surgery, but at least I'm a tool to help them on that journey. Yeah, and it's great. I've experienced that in my own practice. I've had uh, one lady I'm talking about this weekend, as a matter of fact, lost a bunch of weight, uh, uh, brought her, her three month sugar average from nine to uh, six in less than three months. And all of a sudden she doesn't need surgery. Her knees don't hurt. She's hiking, she's doing, I just saw her right before I left. And it's amazing when you see that. And I thought it was crazy. So I called one of your friends, Ben Bickman mm -hmm. you know, from Utah yep. at BYU. And, and he's one of the best researchers in this oh, area. Yes, and and he, so. he kind of laughed and said, Brian, you should expect that. That's an expected thing because the chondrocytes, the little guys in the joints start working again. And so that's pretty impressive that, uh, you know, I, I talked to orthopedic surgeons who are doing this kind of medicine and they're having unbelievable results because unfortunately in our society, there's a lot of people who are too obese to have the surgery because yes. the, the weight will damage the, the prosthesis. Exactly. And they just, with their weight, they're slower to recover and the recovery rates aren't as good. So a lot of insurances are now saying, unless you have it down below a certain number, they won't approve the elective surgeries. So. Yeah, and, and I think what you're seeing too is the bariatric surgeons are using you also. Yes. Pre-op and, and pre -op, for follow-up also. Pre-op and then a lot of patients who end up going to have surgery will ask if I will be their primary care after because I actually understand some of the complications go along with it and different things we can do. And again, a lot of, probably about 20% uh, about of my, popular, my patient load actually have already had surgery who regain the weight because I never really approached the underlying problem, their eating habits, their insulin resistance. Yeah, I lost the weight, but it didn't solve the problem. Yeah, and that's a critically important point. I, I, everyone thinks that bariatric surgery is the easy way out. You don't have to work hard. There's tons of complications, tons of problems. 
And people have to realize we're not at war with the bariatric surgeon. We're not, we, we need to work together. I think we're learning that and saying, hey, let us do what we can. There's a certain percentage of people, like you said, will end up not getting surgery because yeah. they can get their life under control when they're not uh, f- addicted to sugar as much and they're not, they're not like thinking about food constantly and, and starving themselves. Exactly. They do better in the long run. So, exactly. So Rob Seifus, who's a good friend of mine now, he made that point. He says, on the day of surgery, I tell people, look, I'm killing your best friend today. Because their best friends are cookies and cake and ice cream and all those things. And that's what they use to to treat themselves when they're depressed, anxious, stressed. And so what's interesting to me, I never really put two and two together. But he says the divorce rate's 95% of five years after a major gastric bypass surgery. Uh, uh, alcohol abuse, smoking, other drug use, uh, shopping addiction, pornography addiction, they all go up after a, a bariatric surgery. Because we're changing from one addiction to another addiction. Yeah, it's very in- interesting. So you see that a lot in your practice also. Oh, yeah. and, and again, I, I look at it from a hormonal problem, but I also tell patients I'm looking at it as an addiction medicine type of thing. We've, we're trying to treat that aspect and trying to improve things, but we wouldn't tell an alcoholic who's not ready to quit just to stop, but we're telling people who have weight issues, they're supposed to give up their best friend. And like, like Dr. Cyrus says, yeah, so we're, it, we're taking away that that best friend. And that's an important point because if we have a friend who's an alcoholic, you don't offer him one drink. You say, hey, no alcohol because we know it's going to make you stumble. Exactly. But to an obese person who struggles with food addiction, we say, oh, everything in moderation. So we're giving that person a cookie and then they can't stop, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it's working together and having this whole team approach. So I'm really excited about what you're doing yeah. and that's exciting to hear. And um, what's the network like for you? Is it, is it uh, are you finding other doctors who say, hey, you're having success, so I'm gonna start looking at this, or they still just say, you're doing some magic potion over there that <laughs> they, they don't they, understand? They think it's more of a magic potion, because I do see some combination. I use the FDA-approved medications for weight loss, and I have a couple of combinations with some um, compounding pharmacies, and they go, oh, it's just a Rigby special combination. I'm going, no, it's the diet's the biggest factor, but the medicines can help decrease those cravings a little bit, kind of take some of that edge off so they're not wanting or craving that food in the middle of the night or making, using like naltrexone, a medication we use for overdoses and our narcotics, but it can show to decrease inflammation so those joints might f- improve, but also yeah. decrease some of those cravings. So yeah, it's just different tools to help on top of, but I always tell my patients and anybody who calls me, the diet's the biggest factor. If we can fix the diet, a lot of times we don't need these medicines. It's not just, oh, I'm just gonna take a medicine. No, my goal is to actually get people off medicines, get their body metabolically fixed so they can actually improve enough. They don't need the medicines. Medicines are tools, and that's all they are. And what, what a, lot of, a lot of people don't realize when they say calories in, calories out, is that, that there's this emotional component and that when people are stress eaters, when you, they're stressed, they eat more. So what I'm finding is a lot of people are less stressed, less mm-hmm. depressed, their mood gets better, and then they don't need that food to make them feel better. Or they point. now sleep better, or they're exercising to deal with their stress. So all of those things improve, so you're not turning to the food to kind of comfort or make you feel better for a short period of time. Yeah, what about your experience with obstructive sleep apnea? Are you seeing big differences in people coming off their machines and all that? And I've asked our specialists a couple of times, when can I take them off? And they go, eh, it's like, okay. And, I, and at the very beginning, I always, when I'm asking about sleep, I'm kind of always telling people, I'm kind of in a rock and a hard place. Do I put them on a CPAP or do the sleep study and then they feel better so it makes it easier in the weight loss? Or if we get the weight down, do they not need the CPAP machine? So it's kind of that, again, that's talking to the patients, figuring out where they want to go, how they want to do it. If they're struggling, that's something we have to go back and approach. Yeah, and I've seen that too. And and there's a huge contribution of that with sleep apnea. People who aren't sleeping well are depressed and anxious, stressed. And you, you get into that cycle where you're eating more because you're stressed and tired, and we all experience that going through residency. Oh yeah. You know, you're not sleeping a lot, and you, you go through that stress. So the next day, you're starving all day, and so we see that in patients, and that's a valid point because I've had some people get on a CPAP, and then they get their lifestyle right because they have the energy, their mood's better, and they, it's easier for them not to eat all the time. Yeah. And then other people think, "Gosh, let's get them under control so they don't need that CPAP exactly. machine." So, yeah. So we're approaching from that way and working with the sleep medicine specialist to kind of figure out when and where if we can get them off. But a lot of people will go, or my patients will say, 
I just accidentally fell asleep without it. I actually felt better. It's like, I'm not struggling with it. It's like, okay, but we probably should go back and make sure. So I'm not telling everybody just to stop their machines, but hopefully we can get to the point where we don't need it as much. Yeah, and you know, a friend of mine went in, he, he's been on CPAP for 20 years, uh, followed me at one of my talks, he's lost 28 pounds, and he went in to get his, his CPAP titrated. Mm -hmm. And so the next morning he woke up and they never titrated and he was upset. He stormed in the office and started yelling at him and they said, sir, you don't have sleep apnea anymore. And he was shocked that he came to my office and said, you're not going to believe this. I am off my seat. He thought he'd be on it the rest of his life. Yeah. So those are kind of miracles that you're doing. That's yeah. so exciting to see and hear about. And then also the networking. I think that's a really key point is networking with the, the orthopedic surgeons with, yeah. with, the, with the bariatric surgeons because, you know, I'm changing my practice style. And I'm saying that is really what I want to do yeah. because we can make a huge difference and because you're making the patient safer for surgery mm -hmm. and helping the recovery to be better because if they are 40 pounds lighter after surgery, their knee's gonna do better exactly. whatever they're getting done. So yeah. again, we're doing what we can to help people and uh, just, again, my, my goal is trying to fix their metabolic health. Yeah, weight comes along, but it's, it's fixing the metabolic health is the most important aspect. So they feel better, they're functioning better, their testosterone might improve, their yeah, other levels improve. Their, and again, Insulin's a key factor and it's a key, the biggest one, and that's where the diet comes always back into play is we've got to control that. But it, like the discussion we had the other day, at least down at the conference was, what do you do with somebody who's quote unquote insulin sensitive with weight? Yes. Well, that's a start, but let's go look at some of those other factors that can play a key role. Yeah, I think it's so. critical what you're doing. I, I'm, I'm really excited to hear about it, you know, and, and uh, any words of wisdom you want to give people on your way out? And also before we do that, I, I'd love to hear when you first sit down with that patient who's 500 or 600 pounds, mm -hmm. what, what's your approach? How do you, how do you get them uh, bought in and how do you encourage them? Couple of things. I always, when they come and see me, I have them fill out about six pages worth of questioning or kind of questionnaire, kind of figure out their past medical problem, their family history, where they've been, what they've done up to this point. And yes, I tell people I try to get them to the ketosis, but my goal is to try to solve some of these underlying problems and kind of gradually walk them that direction. So some people it's straight to keto, some people it's low carb. Sometimes it's like, let's just start with the basic stuff. Let's eat when you're hungry. Cause a lot of times like, people are going, I have to eat three or four or five times a day, why? Cause everybody keeps telling me I'm supposed to eat. Yeah. Well, are you hungry? No, I'm never hungry till noon. Great, don't eat till noon. But when you do, let's put the right type of fuel. So I look at food as fuel and I use the stupid analogy of cars. When do you put the, gas in the car usually when the light comes on when do you stop when it pops off but you want to put the most the most important part is putting the right type of fuel well, let's put the essential most important type of fuel in your body yeah that's true yeah i'm excited about what you're doing yeah so, it's, it's great it's fun i enjoy it i enjoy going to work yeah me too and i, and I think it's one of those things is what what do you tell people that are you know like how do you get them started motivated like uh, uh what I, what I think what I'm getting at is some people come in my office and they're fired up, ready to go, and yeah. they come back three months, they haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. Other people, I just kind of mentioned it in passing, and then they come back and they lost 40 pounds. And yeah. you know, so how do you, do you have anything that you see, gosh, here's what's gonna help someone be successful or, or, or a red flag, or is it just kind of random, like I, what I'm I, seeing? A lot of times I'm asking them why, because they're usually coming to me for me for weight loss. And I ask, usually ask them, why do they want to do it? It might be that I want to go hiking. It might be I want to get down the floor and play with my grandkids. It might be my surgeon says I have to have this. So when they have that goal, something to work towards, sometimes it makes it easier to yeah. make some of these bigger challenges or give up something or change their eating habits or looking at it from a different perspective. Sometimes that helps. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, and I'm sure you have frustrations along the way. And, oh, you yeah, know, it's all hard do. just trying to get people, but being patient and, and just getting them on the right path. And again, unfortunately, the drawback is when people come to see me for weight loss, they expect that, well, I didn't lose any weight, but I feel better. My joints don't hurt. I'm sleeping better. My, my blood sugars are improving. I'm not needing as much insulin. So a lot of times, especially in the weight loss aspect, they want to see it right away. I always kind of go back to the idea, you didn't get here overnight, you're yeah. not gonna get back. And I always jokingly say, give me twice as long to lose it as it was to gain it. And the reason I say that is, because when you're gaining, let's say it's 10 years, you weren't talking about or worried about, did I eat too much or did I go to the gym? Did I get enough sleep? What's my stress level? Yeah. Now that you're trying to make some of those changes, it's like, am I doing enough? Did I go to the gym enough? Did I sleep enough? Did I, it's like, 
give it time, the weight will come. Yeah. Let's fix the underlying problem. Yeah, that's what I tell people now. I say it's, we're focused on metabolic health, yes. right? Because weight loss is a side effect ultimately because metabolic health brings that. Exactly. So sometimes you have to realize you have a lot of fat around your liver. You have, you're not going to lose 30 pounds. Like, and, and I think a lot of people have heard these stories yeah. that he lost 80 pounds in a week type things, you yeah. know, and they, they have an expectation that's not valid or, or it's not realistic. And I, I, that's, a lot of people hear it on social media is, oh, this person lost so much this quickly. It's like, well, the only person you get to compare yourself is to you. So if you're feeling better, doing better, less yeah. medicine, you're going the right direction. And what's great is we can look at your labs and see you're getting metabolically healthy. Your, your triglycerides are getting better, your HDL, you know, your, your insulin levels, your three month sugar average. So we know as docs, you, you may not know it because you're looking at the weight part of it, mm -hmm. um, that you're getting healthier and you're gonna live longer as a result of that. Yeah. You know, even if you're carrying around some extra weights, we have, we have tons of data on this topic, you know? And, and, and I use a, a bioimpedance scale in my office. Uh, so every time they come in, if they're willing to get on the scale, I do this, and it gives us an idea of your muscle mass, your water, water volume, but also the visceral fat. Again, can't tell it's that versus liver fat, but if that's going down, theoretically, we're now helping that fatty liver type issue and looking at the lab values and stuff like that. Yeah, so I think your, your big advice is be patient. It's yes. gonna take some time. We're gonna work on this together and, and having your support, you yeah. know, and, and then you know building a team around you. And I think that is all critical stuff. So we're all learning exactly. because this is a relatively new medicine. This is like, this is kind of uh, exciting. Yeah. And so, yeah, Ron, Awesome. We're going to get you on my podcast, man. I'm jealous okay. now. We got to talk for a whole hour, but okay. you did a great job. And yeah, yeah. Thanks.